Hi everyone, welcome back to Smug Mug Live. Thank you so much for joining us today wherever you are in the world. This is episode 79 of Smug Mug Live, brought to you as always by Smug Mug and Flickr. If you're looking for somewhere to showcase and show off your images around the world with an incredible photo website, if you're looking to store your images in the cloud, or if you're looking for an incredible full-featured e-commerce solution, then check out everything we have to offer at smugmug.com. Or if you're looking to be part of an incredible photo community, then please check out everything we offer over at flickr.com. Thank you so much for joining me today. I'm so excited about having Jill join me in a few seconds. But before then, I've got a few things to ask you to do. Obviously, I would love it if you would subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. Hit that subscribe button, hit that little bell notification that way whenever we release another episode here on Smug Mug Live with an incredible guest, then you'll be notified and you won't miss a thing. And of course, if you're enjoying today's conversation, then please hit that thumbs up button, show your appreciation. It really helps us here with the channel. And of course, if you have a question for today's guest, then please post that question in the chat window. Start it with the word question dash. That helps me find those questions in amongst all the chat that's going on. Uh, and I'll be sure to ask those questions to Jill today. Uh, and I see some of you in the chat there already giving yourself a shout out. It's always great to see what part of the world you're joining us from. So get in that chat window, give yourself a shout out, let us know where you are and uh, be part of the part of the conversation. This will be be a wonderful conversation, especially if you post your questions. So without further ado, I'm going to go over to today's guest. Um, I've had to write the introduction today because um, there's there's just so much to say about Jill. She's a pioneer uh, of underwater photography. She's an underwater explorer, writer, speaker and filmmaker a pioneer of technical rebreathing, rebreather diving. She has led expeditions into icebergs in Antarctica, volcanic lava tubes and submerged caves worldwide. She is the first explorer in residence of the Royal Canadian Geographical Society. She is also a fellow of the International Scuba Diving Hall of Fame, the Underwater Academy of Arts and Science, the Women's Divers Hall of Fame and the Explorers Club. Without further ado, it is my pleasure to say hello to Jill. Hi, Jill. How are you? Hey, it's great to be here with you, Alistair, from the other side of the pond. <laughs> yeah, it's a big pond, but uh, where are you today? You're in yeah. Canada, yeah? Yeah, near Ottawa, Canada. Ottawa, mm -hmm. Canada. Beautiful, beautiful spring day, early spring. <laughs> Good. Well, it's, it's been beautiful here as well. Uh, lots of people join mm -hmm. us from all over the world in the chat, so it's nice to, to see you all in there. Um, it, it's the first, the first live stream I've done where I've had to write the bio because I knew... <laughs> I just I just wouldn't remember all the exact details of of everything you've done, and that really is just the the uh, the small bio. It's just the the, the brief introduction because, man, you have done so many things uh, in the world of of diving, cave exploration, and underwater photography. I'm pretty lucky. I kind of pinch myself every day. It's a it's a good job. <laughs> <laughs> a good job. Yeah. Do you consider it a job? Is it a lifestyle? A job? You know, I don't know how to find the dividing line between, you know, what's fun and what's work because it's all it's all fun to me. I mean, if I retired, I'd be doing exactly the same thing, really. <laughs> yeah. yeah. If you couldn't do diving for a living and you retired, what would you do? I'd be diving. <laughs> diving. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, let's see who's joining us today. Scott uh, joins us in the chat, says hello from... I guess that's Illinois. Hey, uh, Illinois, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Mauro is joining us from Slovenia. Hey there. Mm. John Brown is joining us from the Dog Pound. All right. <laughs> uh, have you ever been to the Dog Pound? I don't think so. <laughs> is Alberta. Is, been... is Alberta, yeah. Yeah. So mm, yeah. Somewhere you need to go. I, he, John, John's a regular uh, watcher of the show. Ah. He says it's, says it's beautiful out there. Randy joined us cool. from rainy Tennessee. Uh, mm -hmm. Andy joins us from Poland. Hi, Andy. Poland. Welcome. Uh, someone called Sharks and Rex. Hello from downtown Ottawa. We're neighbors. Ah, very Sharks, good. <laughs> Sharks and Rex. Cool name. Um, yeah. Chris says hi. I'm looking at all these bio pictures. Lots of lots of divers oh, hey, in the Chris. bio. <laughs> and uh, so I'm sure you you probably know some of these people that are joining us mm -hmm. today. So that's really yeah, good. you Thank bet. Thank you. 
Yeah, thank you for joining mm -hmm. us. And of course, if you have questions, this, this show is going to be uh, a lot of fun if you post your, your questions. And there's so much we could talk about, but mm -hmm. we are going to try and stay on the kind of photographic side of, of uh, mm -hmm. all the different things you, you do. But uh, no, the chat's, the chat's suddenly blown up. So let's, Kim says hi from Salt Sea Marie. Lovely. Yep. Gary says, yo, Gary Monroe. I think, Gary, you're in Canada, I think, correct? Uh, he's been on the show a number of times. I think he's in Canada. Uh, Lloyd oh, is Lloyd. from Victoria. Hey, Lloyd. Dive, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> Valentina is from Romania. Mm -hmm. Hi, Valentina. Yeah, excellent. And uh, Ina's joining us from South Africa. So very, mm. very impressive international audience today for the show. So thank you all for joining us. Nice. Um, we, have a, we have some cool things to share. We have lots of imagery. Uh, and we have some video that we're going to share today. But uh, I did promote the show with a couple of really, really exciting images. So I'm going to go straight over mm -hmm. to some of the images uh, to, to have a little mm -hmm. chat about them. This is one of the images I used of you uh, to promote this the, this live stream, mm -hmm. really because it's such a dramatic image. Uh, it shows all the amazing gear that you use, uh, and it mm -hmm. shows you descending into Mordor, into the middle of the... <laughs> the planet <laughs> sort of i mean this is actually a, probably the cave that i've done the most diving in in my in my whole life this is uh uh it, at Ginny springs in north florida i used to live across the street and the the <laughs> cave itself is called devil's ear that's because of that uh yellowy red tannic water that um it's actually like the river water, the Santa Fe River is tannic, just like a, you know, a tea bag soaks in water, mm -hmm. trees turn the water orangey um, yellow, but the water coming out of the spring is turquoise blue. And so at the perfect timing, you get like red water on top of blue water and you're looking through this like kaleidoscope lens. It's such a fantastic thing to capture. It's the incredible colors uh, all merging mm -hmm. together. And I believe this is a yeah. selfie, yeah? It is, yeah. <laughs> I do a lot of selfies because we have to hang out on decompression an awful lot. And so if you've got time on your hands, you might as well shoot selfies underwater. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, I guess that you also do a lot of selfies because in a lot of these places you go, you're the only person that's ever been there. So. Yeah, and, and I do a lot of solo diving and solo photography and videography too, especially this year with COVID. Uh, I've been like 99% on my own um, shooting and setting things up and being my own model. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's interesting you say that diving and, and on your own. I always thought yeah. not being a diver. I always mm -hmm. thought diving was something that from a safety thing, you always did it with a buddy. But having spoke to you on many occasions now and got to know mm -hmm. what you do, you know, you literally are the only person scrambling into some of these, uh, these places under our earth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we always recommend buddy diving because then you've got a redundant brain. You've got someone else that can then help you out and correct uh, something that's wrong. Uh, but some of the places where I dive, it is actually probably safer for me to be on my own because it's very small and tough to turn around and um, nasty conditions. So, um, you know, in those cases, it makes a lot more sense for me to be on my own. Yeah, uh, a lot of the places you go on your own, I wouldn't even go if there was an army of us because uh, <laughs> it's, it's, <laughs> it's terrifying, some of it. Um, let's uh, let's look at some of the places you go in some of these images mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. because you do explore caves um, all over the world mm -hmm. and, and not just explore but mm -hmm. discover uh, caves all over the world. And uh, I guess without this this person in this image, it could just look like a cave. You wouldn't even know there was water in, it, in a lot of these images. Yeah, I mean, it's important to have a person in these shots just for that sense of scale, because mm -hmm. you're right, it could be minuscule or it could be the size of a baseball stadium. But this is a cave in uh, in the Bahamas, in Abaco. Um, and this was on a National Geographic shoot. There are actually two divers in the shot. <laughs> the, the, uh, the second light there behind, yep. like the one that sort of spot towards us is being held by another diver. So, yeah, you can yeah. just see their, the reflection in their goggles. Uh, yeah. You can see their goggles quite well there. Um, mm -hmm. Mm. And uh, this image struck me mm. because this this looks so structural. This, in many ways, it looks like 
Mm-hmm. It's it's a, a wreck that has, you know, beams and columns, but this is all completely natural in a cave. Yeah, yeah. It's These formations are so beautiful. These were obviously formed when the cave was dry, not filled with water, like when the ocean levels, water table were lower. And um, I love this spot. We, we call it the gnomes because these little pillars that you see, the stalagmites, um, kind of remind me of gnomes and and my friend Brian K. Cook that uh, uh, sort of guides through these caves in this area has named a lot of these spots that he originally explored. And a lot of them have like Hobbit and Tolkien themes. (laughs) If you discover a new system, a new cave, do you get to name it? Yeah, yeah, you can name the new, you can name the whole cave system. You can name passages and rooms and little navigational points as well, yeah. Interesting. I have, uh, as, as I mentioned earlier, we have some some video uh, to share, and uh, mm-hmm. this this video we'll, we'll talk over this video because it gives a mm-hmm. real a real sense of the places you go and what you do. Mm-hmm. Maybe you can talk us through some of this incredible yeah. footage. Yeah. So for those that aren't cave divers, I mean, obviously these water filled passages beneath our feet are completely black, and so the only light in these environments is the light that we bring either with strobes or continuous lighting and so if i'm not like setting up on a camera uh, tripod and being my own model like when i'm working with people like this i'm I'm training them in how to carry and paint with the lights for video or or you know how to position themselves in the cave to get the most of our out of our lights or slave strobes to capture the images. Um, but this is probably my favorite uh, cave system in the in the world. It's just so beautiful. And it, it's actually been dry many times in Earth's history. So there's sort of multi layers of formations and really mm-hmm. cool animal life as well, which yeah. I also get to photograph. <laughs> and uh, yeah, um, and so this is, I, this I is could Abico, go here a million yeah. times. Yeah, it this is, is it is. Mm-hmm. This is in the, the Bahamas? Kinda, is that right? It is, yeah. Yep. Near uh, Marsh Harbor would be where you'd fly into for that. And uh, it to me, this is like swimming through a crystal chandelier, some of the places, like the rooms. There's an area of the cave we call the glass factory. It's so delicate with crystal formations, like the ones you see on the ceiling here, mm-hmm. that um, you have to have the best diving technique and just such care so that you don't stir up silt, but also so you don't damage any of these you know, precious, precious formations that that won't grow back until like the sea levels are so low that this cave uh, yeah. sort of reforms itself. And that that kick you do that you can see here, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. that's specifically designed so that you're propelling yourself, but with minimum motion, so you don't disturb yeah. stuff. Yeah. Yeah, we call it the frog kick because if you just flutter kicked up and down the way most people think of kicking, then um, that disturbs the silt off the floor and even makes it rain down from the ceiling. So we do that that frog kick um, so that we don't disturb or break anything and can just kind of move slowly through the environment and get the shots. <laughs> so I guess that's something you, you probably have to kind of learn because a lot of divers probably just use a traditional sort of kick technique like Mm -hmm. you would when you were swimming. So you have to kind of Mm -hmm. relearn how to move yourself. Yeah, here's a funny thing. I mean, we teach cave divers to like bend their knees and and do that little frog kick. Uh, But if you use a cave diver as a model in your photography, because their knees are bent and their fins are up, and you shoot them head on, it looks like their fins are like kind of, you know, Mickey Mouse ears Funny sticking ears. out of their head. <laughs> and um, so, yeah, I, I sometimes have to take people with perfect trim underwater, like my models and say, all right, I know that's the right trim, but now we made, we need to make it look right for the camera. For the, so you don't look shot. bizarre. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. And then a lot of times uh, you're talking about trying to move and not disturb stuff. We've got lots mm-hmm. of pictures we'll get to later, but, with just the amount of gear that you need to take, and we'll get to those. But um, mm-hmm. this this image here kind of shows you mm-hmm. doing the day job uh, particularly well. Yeah. Talk us through um, the the camera mm-hmm. equipment that you would typically have with you. Yeah, so in this case, I'm shooting a Canon 5D Mark IV in an Aquatica housing. So it's a, a sealed um, housing. Uh, and I've got a couple of Inon strobes on there as well. Um, and then for life support, I'm wearing a rebreather. So this is a little bit different than traditional scuba where you make bubbles. Like this device recaptures the bubbles, scrubs the carbon dioxide out of them, and then 
and then replaces any metabolized oxygen. So it's a, a full life support system, like the same thing you'd wear if you were doing a spacewalk. Mm -hmm. But the beauty of this for photography is that I won't make bubbles because bubbles make noise and noise scares away wildlife, but it also will strike the ceiling of the cave and make silt rain down on you. Yeah. So a rebreather is kind of a photographer's dream and you, you have a completely different um, experience with wildlife when you wear a rebreather because you're silent. I see this picture is taken by one of your, your friends back in 2015. Mm -hmm. So your, your gear has changed probably quite a bit over the last uh, five or six years and we'll see some of it, um, the, some of that gear in, in a few more, mm -hmm. uh, a few images later on, but uh, very mm -hmm. interesting. So the rebreather um, technology, you know, you adopted that very early and, and were quite mm -hmm. kind of influential in, in the development of that whole that whole system mm -hmm. and, and where it's got you because you go you go deeper and further and longer than I guess most other people on the planet um can you do that with just a standard rebreather or, or I'm assuming you're probably taking exotic gases and stuff with you as mm -hmm. well yeah yeah, when we go deeper than, you know, 100 feet or so, we um, start to really shift the mixes of gas that we're using uh, to breathe. And so we're removing um, some of the nitrogen, replacing it with helium, lowering the oxygen levels. And all of this is just to provide us with kind of the optimum life support environment for every step of the dive to extend our range and, um, you know, deal with a lot of safety issues really for the the slow staged return back to the surface again yeah. and you you were telling me in a previous conversation about not only needing all that gear but your photographic gear has to be <laughs> has to be fairly uh fairly extensive and fairly robust because because you're going so deep even you know way deeper than than just normal scuba divers um, mm -hmm. The pressure starts to activate some of the buttons on the housing, yeah? It can't, yeah. So uh, Aquatica always puts like these beefed up springs on the buttons on my housing. Because if they didn't, then when you hit about 200 feet deep, the water pressure itself will actually depress those buttons. And, and, like the first time I experienced that, I, I dropped down and I'm like, hey, my camera's gone in to record and I can't turn it off. <laughs> and then a lot of other weird things started happening. And I thought, okay, we'll just go with the flow, shoot continuously. And um, sure enough, as I came up from depth, the buttons sort of released and, and uh, turned themselves off. So now I have all my housings prepped for, for deep. Yeah, and I know you work very closely with Aquatica and, and making sure that mm -hmm. you have a great partnership there to to help yeah. each other out. You know, they help you and you help mm -hmm. give them great insight because you go places mm -hmm. that most people don't go. So um, yeah. to give some people some insight into my connection with you, I first uh, I first learned about Jill, like many people, probably through this, through your TED Talk. Um, mm -hmm. I'm a great lover of TED Talks and I go on a lot of explorations, uh, much safer than the explorations you do. I go on these explorations of finding out people after I've been inspired to, to find out more about them uh, through listening to TED Talks, a wonderful TED Talk. I'd highly encourage everybody to go uh, and you know check, search for you on, on TED and, and listen to that talk. And then after I had I'd, you know watched the TED Talk and found out a little bit more about you, I came across this. Into the uh -huh. Planet, your book, which we'll talk a little bit more about later. Um, and I read that book. And then after reading the book, um, an amazing thing happened. I discovered that you were a Smug Mug customer, uh, which was <laughs> yeah. just just joyous for me. It's like, I want to know more about this person. And then oh, they use our product. So I, I then went on this trip of discovering some incredible photography um, via your Smug Mug site. So we're delighted to have mm. you uh, on Smug Mug. So thank you for doing that. But uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the book uh, mm -hmm. in a little bit. But let's talk about some of these images that I you know, found on your Smug Mug site that mm -hmm. absolutely just are you know, hard to comprehend yeah. in, in some, some instances of what we're actually looking at here. So maybe you can talk us through some of these incredible shots. Yeah. 
this this is an amazing opportunity. This is a cave in Bermuda that's actually not open for diving. And I first saw a really bad photo of these formations on the back of the cave diving manual that I used when I learned to cave dive. And a photographer had taken like a little, you know, vertical shot. And I thought, ooh, is that ever cool? I want to go there. And I found out where it was, what it was, and then found out it was closed. And you know, fast forward about 20 years, I actually got permission for like a half day to go there to shoot these formations because I thought, well, I want to shoot these in a way that really, you know, they deserve because it's such a remarkable spot. Yeah, yeah. that's uh, incredible. What's causing is the light on the the top of the water is that just reflection light? So there, I'm actually under an air bell here, ah, so. Okay. Uh, yeah, so if you went up to the surface in that location, there's all kinds of formations over your head, like in this little bell in the ceiling, basically. So it's quite shallow there. It gives you lots of time to shoot. <laughs> and the, the deposits have just created these incredible structures, mm -hmm. which you say, of course, mm -hmm. you know so much about the geology of these places, because these are all formed when there's no water there, because it's, it's mm -hmm. water dripping and depositing yeah. that makes these, and then you know, the sea yeah. level rises and suddenly mm -hmm. you have to swim to be able to see suddenly it. Suddenly <laughs> you get to swim, not have to. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. The, um, a few questions coming up in the chat, but we'll get to them mm -hmm. in a moment. Uh, so mm -hmm. this is, there's a couple of shots here that mm -hmm. are, you know, there's such a, an unusual perspective for many of us. And I guess mm -hmm. a lot of what you do, you see very unique perspectives on this world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, here I'm literally in a sinkhole. There's a cave system attached to this, but this is the entrance. I'm literally lying on my back looking straight up out of the sinkhole so I can get the edges of the rock kind of kind of framing the shot. Normally I'm trying to balance the light so that I get a little bit of illumination around the edges of like the inside. But in this case, I wanted that to frame the shot. And so I, I'm actually sort of balancing for, for what I see, those cypress trees above water there. And uh, it's kind of, for me, what, a, a picture that encapsulates the, the world that I'm, that I'm working in. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And, and this, one, this one looks like a world. This is, mm -hmm. <laughs> it looks like yeah. you're looking from space at the blue planet, you know, it's incredible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, same sort of thing. I'm literally like flat on my back looking straight up. And, and I actually did a, a little video sequence where I sort of spin on this location and the clouds kind of looked like the continents of, of the world. So it kind of felt like that. Yeah. yeah and cool. I, the, the surface creates a really interesting lens effect that I love. I love yeah. a lot of the split half and halves and looking up in shallow water. Yeah. So how you, this, this to me looks like super wide uh, kind of fisheye type mm -hmm. lens yeah but is, is that the case or is it also to do with the, the 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 surface of the water creating this effect as well it's it's partly the water it's a like it's a 16 millimeter with a full frame mm -hmm. sensor um so it's it's pretty wide but uh but yeah the water does a lot of that effect yeah, yeah and you're uh so when you're underwater with these housing being being a complete novice uh or, or playing mm -hmm. a part of a complete novice when uh are they fixed lenses or are you able to zoom on, on the focal? Uh, I mean, you can use a zoom. Um, like a lot of people use like a, you know, 8 to 15, 12 to 35 or something like that. I prefer um, just a, a, a wide, like 16 millimeters, really mm -hmm. great, I think. Yeah. Um, because as soon as you add the zooming function, then you're also adding some more gears and things to yeah. the, the whole system and another extension tube and yeah. More, mm -hmm. more weight, more things to go wrong. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> yeah. More, more detail. So just a, just a prime lens and mm -hmm. uh, yeah. yeah, that's mm -hmm. cool. Uh, mm -hmm. You also you mentioned you do a lot of wildlife, but you know this is this is uh, a lot of wildlife in just one shot. <laughs> yeah, this is off the coast of Newfoundland in uh, Terra Nova National Park. We just came across a jellyfish bloom. So a jellyfish bloom is this congregation of, of, of jellyfish like in the millions and these are moon jellyfish they don't sting so I rolled off the boat right in the middle of them and it was kind of like being in a bouncy ball house at Ikea you know? <laughs> <laughs> except these are all sort of squishy but there were so many of them like this is actually not the densest uh 
you know, yeah. group of them. They were so thick, I lost my buddy in the jellyfish, and my buddy would just kind of appear once in a while. <laughs> it was kind of <laughs> cool. Well, I think we can give people a, a little bit more sense of, of just exactly how this mm -hmm. felt by sharing mm -hmm. a little video. Was, was this video, I'm assuming this is a selfie video, if... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do a lot of that when cool things happen, when yeah. I'm let's, swimming let's, with jellyfish or sea lion or <laughs> other things like that. Let's play this video. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There you go. Swimming in jelly soup. Yeah. I'm glad you said now that they didn't sting because when I first watched this, I thought, you know, you do have some exposed <laughs> exposed skin there, but. Uh, you know what's funny is like every once in a while in amongst all these moon jellyfish suddenly out of the moon jellies i would see a bright red uh it's a different kind of jellyfish that does have mm. um stingers and so i'm like ah! you know get away <laughs> they want it to be a man of war or something like that so, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and then it's not all it's not all wildlife and uh caves uh but a lot of mm -hmm. uh, man-made structures as well that uh, mm -hmm. end up at the bottom of our oceans uh, yeah we've done a lot of wreck diving yeah, this is a, a shipwreck in Newfoundland that was sunk in 1942 by German U-boats. And um, it's uh, it's cold water, so this is, you know, minus, well, you, you know, actually probably two or three degrees maybe in the summertime there. <laughs> um, but I just think this this wreck is so spectacular because you, you get off the bow of it and um, get this this view that's just, just breathtaking when the visibility is good. Yeah. Uh, again, another diver for scale. I guess scale, mm -hmm. scale is something we spoke about a lot because, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes it is difficult in these places where you are without some kind of human element to really know whether this is yeah. just a tiny little boat or whether this is a huge, mm -hmm. you know, ocean going vessel. So, and the same with cave mm -hmm. systems. Absolutely. I mean, people don't have a a conception of, of the scale of these places. And so, yeah, it, it helps to put a, a model in it. Yeah. I'm just uh, having a little look at the questions here. Let's, let's, a few questions. Yeah. Coming, so let's, let's jump to some of them. Um, mm -hmm. uh, some of them I might, I've got some images coming up, so I might come to some of these questions mm -hmm. uh, out of order. So don't, don't worry if mm -hmm. I'm not getting to your question straight away. Uh, Scott asks, hi, Scott, thanks for your question. With extended diving, do you ever find battery life an issue? If so, do you have a means to extend your camera or flash batteries? Uh, it kind of depends on, on the camera. Uh, so some cameras eat batteries a lot more than others. Uh, and, and yes, uh, so certain housings we've had to kind of carve out ways to squeeze in an extra battery pack. Um, but for the most part nowadays, uh, we have much longer lasting strobes. We get a lot more fires, like, you know, 250 or more fires out of a strobe or, or even, you know, a couple of hours out of a really uh, long lived video light. But back in the day, um, you know, even 10 to 15 years ago, there were some video lights that I used frequently that, that might have 10 or 15 minutes before you needed to, you know, get another one. And so we would carry and stage multiple lights that were the size of tanks or bigger into the cave system so that we could drop off one that was used up and pick up another one mm -hmm. yeah how long can you stay under for what's the long or what's the longest you've stayed under for i mean most of my dives are in the one to three hour range i would say um but it's not unusual for me to do you know four to six hours on a really deep technical dive and the longest mission i ever had was 22 hours so um yeah <laughs> 22 hours underwater one. So, uh, yeah, it was a, a kind of a complicated dive where I did five hours of bottom time at 300 feet. So that's for the, the divers in the audience. And that needed 17 hours of decompression. And some of that decompression was done in a dry habitat. Mm -hmm. But I wasn't back safely, you know, uh, on the surface until 22 hours. <laughs> oh, so using, using like a bell mm -hmm. chamber that's submerged mm -hmm. to, to decompress in? Wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're made of different stuff, Joel. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's look at a few more man-made things under the water. So yeah. I'm assuming these went down with the ship. 
Yeah, this is from Truck Lagoon in, in Micronesia. And uh, really interesting, you know, ships hold full of old trucks from, from the war. These ships were wrecked, went down in Operation Hailstone in World War II. And uh, this was like my last big trip before the COVID lockdown. I literally got out of Micronesia uh, kind of on some of the last flights before the country closed down because they've stayed closed to protect their people because they have very little medical health yeah. infrastructure. So I was quite grateful <laughs> to uh, <laughs> to have this opportunity to dive there and get home. And it, it might be my next huge trip, uh, you know, because I'm going back in January 2022. I hope there's stuff before then, but, you know, we're yeah. all... We're all waiting to see what happens with vaccinations. Yeah. yeah. And like all photography, this image is, you know, is is, is secret as the lighting. Um, so this image, is that mm -hmm. a light that you've placed or is that another diver? Mm -hmm. or? Yeah. So I actually put the, the light in the cab of the truck and I've got like smaller lights on the camera. The biggest challenge in this is when you're inside a shipwreck, there's so much silt to stir up that it's very hard to keep things clear. Um, again, if you exhaled any bubbles, they'd hit the ceiling and the silt would rain down on you. But one errant fin kick in this spot and you're kind of screwed. And and I'm literally like kind of squeezed between the wall and the trucks and got the camera and I'm kind of going, ah, click. <laughs> so it's so is this tight, the kind tight. of passage kind of perfect shot that uh perfect spot for a rebreather just because there is so much silt and just makes it yeah yeah less less likely to to stir up all the all yeah the silt that's yeah there. it really helps mm -hmm. <laughs> you mentioned earlier this kind of half and half shot this is this is kind of cool mm -hmm. yeah this is up in tobermory ontario in canada this is actually um, one of the very first shipwrecks i ever dived on called the sweepstakes it's only in 20 feet of water and people drive over this in glass bottom boats today to, to look at it or they snorkel. Um, but for me, it's kind of the perfect opportunity to take one of those shots where you get the above and below and, and a sense of both those environments. And it's tough to get the exposure right on these shots, um, but quite rewarding when you do. Yeah, yeah really cool. Um, and then your yeah. photography isn't all underwater. Um, you obviously, you, mm -hmm. you're in some of the most incredible parts of the world and you do a lot of uh, landscape and travel mm -hmm. and wildlife uh, as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, and I, and I like to use my photographs to communicate about important issues, water issues, climate change issues. Um, so, uh, you know, working in these ice environments, I feel like every time I take a picture either underwater or topside of an iceberg that, uh, that this is an endangered species. I mean, our yeah. cryosphere is disappearing. And uh, yeah, so that's how I kind of looked at at this shot even it's like all right this this iceberg is actually down in newfoundland it's drifted down from from the arctic in in the summertime and this would be i guess probably late june when i photographed this um and it and you know within a matter of days this particular little bird you know dissolves away and melts into the sea so nobody else will ever take a picture of this yeah definitely yeah. A, a unique opportunity mm -hmm. uh, when you're photographing mm -hmm. icebergs um and, mm. uh, Lots of animals in your world. Yeah, too. these are whale sharks. So this is in Holbosch in Mexico. And uh, these whale sharks are about the size of a school bus, if you've never had a chance to see them. And it's a shark, but there's no teeth. They're, they kind of suck up the ocean like a Hoover vacuum cleaner and, you know, take the fish and let the, the water run through their, uh, their gills. And uh, they are magnificent, like they, they have polka dots all over them. And when you first spot them below you in the water column, you kind of you're struggling to focus and it's like is that polka dots and it's like it looks like stars and then suddenly it starts to take form and you see oh oh yeah it's a whale shark how cool and uh they're more fixed on feeding um than than on you as a photographer so you can get quite close to them yeah. probably one of the more dangerous animals you're likely to encounter um mm -hmm. and yeah pretty mm -hmm. pretty close what was this encounter and how did that happen uh, I was actually filming a documentary in the Arctic um, called Under Thin Ice, um, and uh, I understand from my from my colleague that I was the first woman to jump in the water with wild polar bears and walruses to film them, uh, but my, my colleague Mario Sear had 
been doing this for about 20 years and our plan was to get in the water and for me to shoot him shooting the polar bear swimming over our heads so this is the last shot you get before you like just very quickly descend <laughs> underwater because when a polar bear is swimming at you 10 kilometers an hour which they do they're coming for a meal and yep. um yeah, it's. I don't know if I'll do that again. It was extremely dangerous. Yeah, they've only got one thing in their mind. Can they dive particularly well, or are you pretty safe under the yeah. water? Yeah. Uh, well, you know, I, I have had them dive after me, but only, you know, maybe to, a, I, I'd say maybe four or five meters deep. But one of my colleagues, Amos Nachum, is claims that he's had one uh, chase him all the way to 20 meters. Wow. Um, so I can't even imagine. I would have absolutely crapped myself. <laughs> yeah. I, I'd assumed with like all that fur and the air trapped in it, they'd be super buoyant and wouldn't be able to get down mm -hmm. that far. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, note to self, if they can go 20 meters, then geez. I, I imagine a skinny, skinny bear can dive deeper than a blubbery bear like one because it's more negatively buoyant but two because it's hungry and quite frankly i mean these animals used to hunt on the ice and now they have to hunt in the water because the ice is disappearing so um you know hunger teaches you all kinds of new things <laughs> desperation yeah um mm -hmm. going, to, going back through some of the questions here uh before i lose track there's quite a lot uh scott mm -hmm. asks how did you get started in underwater photography and what tip would you give someone who wants to start in underwater photography? Sell everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I literally, I had an ad agency in Canada. I, I'm formally trained a, uh, as a graphic designer. I have a Bachelor of Fine Arts. And I was teaching scuba nights and weekends. And I loved my job. I loved the creative aspects of, of my art. But I didn't like being indoors. So I literally sold everything I owned. I sold the business and I moved to the Cayman Islands with my Nikonis 5 camera and started to shoot and submit articles and pictures for magazines. And, and I just, I just volunteered for projects and, and um, kept asking for the next gig. So I am a 30 year overnight success. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm going to bring this shot up because you told me this is mm. this is where you learned to dive. Is that right? Yeah, it is. Again, that's uh, Tobermory, Ontario. And the water was by no means this clear when I learned to dive. Um, but invasive species, these zebra mussels that have inv invaded the Great Lakes have filtered the water. And it's very clear right now. Right. It's It's not good for the environment, but photographers sure like it. Yeah, <laughs> it's interesting. I, I, there's, you know, obviously we have, well, maybe not obviously, but there's a Tobermory in Scotland. Uh, yeah. And it's not somewhere I would think of going diving. It's probably a lot colder than, than this part. Well, maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe, maybe not. Uh, yeah. I, yeah. It was 37 or oh, 4 Celsius in the water when I learned to dive. So yeah, maybe it's <laughs> not about too the warm. same then. <laughs> yeah, maybe it is. Mm -hmm. um, and then mm -hmm. you mentioned your Nikonis camera. I think the next picture, if I can make it go, is, is you with a little yeah. Nikonis camera. Mm -hmm. Me shooting my little Nikonis with a, a single strobe. Uh, yeah, yeah. That's all I moved to the Cayman Islands with. And then uh, after a few months in the Cayman Islands, I was on a deep dive and I actually crushed the camera. So <laughs> imploded the camera. It was a horrible moment when I realized that I had sold my business, I'd sold everything I owned, and now I was like in the Cayman Islands trying to become a photographer and I didn't even own a working camera anymore <laughs> or anything else. What crushed so it, the was... depth or physically yeah. crushed it? It was the depth? Yeah, it was the depth. Yeah, I was, I was quite deep and then having an absolutely glorious dive when suddenly it's... I can't even begin to tell you how loud the concussion is when something implodes and then oh, you've wow. got this you know, of bubbles and you know, there's no saving it. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's definitely yeah. not good for the camera. Um, no. I have, I have a, a wonderful story about um, one of the, f the founders of Smug Mug, Chris McCaskill, Baldy, as, as many of us know mm -hmm. him, who, who loved to, all types of photography, he still, he loves all types of photography, but he was on holiday with his extended family and he bought a wonderful big housing for his um, Canon camera went diving with it and got completely uh, 
soaked, got it, it just leaked and completely filled mm -hmm. the camera up. And it was a it was a huge one of the big new Mark One DXs or whatever it was. Um, and then yeah. he suddenly remembered one of the grandkids had been playing with a kind of thin black plastic <laughs> thing earlier in the day and realized it was the the seal, the O ring from, from the housing. <laughs> Oh my so god! That that was well. We that have a, toast. We have a bit of a saying as underwater photographers: "It's not if you're going to flood a camera; it's kind of when." So it yeah. will happen in your career. So be prepared. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Gary asks as a question: he says, what is the key? What's the key in getting an immersive underwater cave shot? What are the mm. what are the key components to that makes a great shot? I think that it's using what I call justifiable light. So I don't want to over light from the camera. So I'll use either very low power on strobes or continuous lighting. Like I use light and motion solar lights, um, but I put big lights or slave strobes in the hands of the divers so that all the light that you see in the photograph appears to have come from one of the divers light sources. It just makes it feel believable um, because if you have too much light in the foreground and you overlight the scene, then it looks quite theatrical and unreal. So I think justifiable light is what animates a photograph, whether it's a cave picture or something else. I, I try to make things look not um, not fake. <laughs> I want them to look as natural as possible. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Maru asks, uh, how do you set up a shot underwater do you instruct for lights and poses beforehand or how do you mm -hmm. communicate with other divers when you're underwater mm -hmm. so i mean sometimes when it's a complicated shoot we'll um we'll go through storyboards that i draw out and we'll even do a rehearsal top side like you know here's what i want you to do here's here's your position relative to the camera here's where i want you to shine the light or here's why i want you to hold the slave strobe um, and then when we go underwater, I'm just using hand signals and light signals to try and remind people about what's coming next. Sometimes I will use audio where I wear a full face mask that has a microphone and my models are wearing um, buddy phones. It's a bone conduction earphone where they're able to hear me underwater. Yeah. But that adds a fair bit of complexity and gear and expense to a shot. And then there's other times where I'm literally just documenting stuff that's actually happening with no opportunity to pose or stop. So live exploration, shooting. And in that case, I love working with people that I've worked with before or for a long time uh, because they kind of know what to do with lights. They know where my camera is and what I'm trying to achieve. Yeah, we've got some shots here that... Uh feature pictures of yourself that were used uh for covers of various various magazines yeah. over the years but they they give a good sense mm -hmm. of of the type of gear you have mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. and maybe we can talk about some of that gear a little bit more now because we all do love to talk yeah. about gear. but i i noticed looking through a lot of your your images um it's it's difficult to to find a lot of images of you with your mm -hmm. gear because on most of these expeditions yeah. you're the photographer so unless it's a That's selfie right. or you've you've you're with colleagues where you've set up stuff mm -hmm. um there's not mm -hmm. as many shots of you but these covers give us a great sense of uh yeah. what you're carrying with us so what's what's typically i was going to say in the bag mm -hmm. but that doesn't make sense mm -hmm. when you're underwater but yeah you know, so this one was shot by my buddy Cass Dobbin, who's very talented, and we were doing some real exploration in a mine in Newfoundland. So it's cold water. I'm wearing a rebreather. Um, I, the helmet I'm using for my own protection, but I'm also using the helmet uh, uh, as, as part of my 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 own useful lighting, as opposed to you know lighting a scene. And you'll see one of my lights that's angled downward, the pink one on the helmet and one that's pointing forward, the one that's pointing downward, I can just sort of turn on so I can see camera controls and things. Right. Um, you'll also see on my left hand, there's a there's a light, um, that's a light and motion light again, and I'm using that as a focus light uh, because we're working in blackness and I, I can bring in this very wide beam, soft light to focus and, and take a shot um, without it ending up as a spot in the photo. Um, yeah, again, a, an Aquatica housing, and uh, I guess I'm using, yeah, I'm using the ion strobes here uh, and the rebreather. But yeah, this is all cold water 
ready. Uh, and I also am doing a little bit of lighting forecast. So I've got a, a Sola Pro in my hand that's kind of uh, pointing backwards and sort of separating me from the background. So I don't just sort of blend in with the cave like one big black mass with a red helmet. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Mm. Uh, and this one, yeah, this one's shot by a friend of mine, Mark Long, down in Florida in a, in a spring. Uh, and again, a pretty, pretty similar setup with the focus light in the left hand and strobes, um, and the aquatica housing helmet, the rebreather. Yeah. But we have Mother Nature's backlight yeah. <laughs> separating me from the environment. <laughs> does, a, does a rebreather help um, with the temperature of the, the, the gas you're breathing in? Yeah. If you're breathing from a scuba tank, then um, every breath you take is the temperature of the water. But the rebreather um, scrubber that's removing the carbon dioxide has an exothermic reaction that's creating a little bit of warmth. So the, the breaths that you're taking in are, are warmer. Right. Yeah. Interesting. I guess that mm -hmm. can be beneficial in certain parts of the world, which we'll get to yeah. eventually. Mm -hmm. I think there's another cover shot here. Maybe not like yeah, that. that's a selfie, actually, um, <laughs> on Tico down in Cabo San Lucas. Um, yeah. Well, I'm going to go back yeah. back here. Mm -hmm. um, there was a short mm -hmm. question from Gary who says, when you're underwater, are you chimping when underwater, i.e. You looking at all your shots or how, mm. and how are you framing the shots? So can you see the back of the camera? Can you see the, the, the screen mm -hmm. through the housing and check out what you're mm -hmm. photographing? So here's a trick with, with when you take a camera underwater, the LCD lies <laughs> right? okay. because it's calibrated for, for topside use. It's calibrated for daytime lighting. So when you go into an underwater cave, a completely black environment, if you were using that to judge exposure, um, then everything would be underexposed. So you've got to use the histograms to expose and just use the LCD for, um, for your composition, basically. Um, otherwise, you're going to be very disappointed <laughs> with what you bring back. <laughs> Uh, so, now so in you're, some fr you're cases, framing you're framing using the LCD. You're not looking through the, yeah. the viewfinder. Oh, actually, I, I am sometimes. So, so in fact, that camera, um, I have a forty-five degree viewfinder on it, so that I can just look down into it. As, you know, as you're swimming along, you want to be able to look down into it, as opposed to it completely blocking your 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 face. Um, and then sometimes I also have a monitor on there. So I have an Aquatica monitor that helps me to see even better, especially with my my fading eyesight over the years. <laughs> something, something I was going to ask you, a lot of the images I see of you, do you have bifocal goggles, mask? I do, yeah. yeah. I wear pretty heavy reading um, uh, uh, readers. So I, I have readers that are ground into the underwater mask so that I'm able to see all the menu commands, controls and things like that. And uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I did, I did notice that. I guess it, it helps you look down but see into the distance when you're, you're looking ahead. Um, I've, yeah. queued up, I've queued up another photograph here because this, this uh, photograph I find amazing. Um, and I guess, is this, is this oh, how yeah. you d discover some of these incredible <laughs> caves and cave systems that just look mm. like a puddle on the surface? Yeah, this is a wild location. This is uh, in Egypt, close to the Libyan border. And I, I led an expedition there for National Geographic um, right after the Arab Spring. A terrible, terrible <laughs> time as a woman to lead an expedition in, in a leaderless country. Yeah. <laughs> it was pretty crazy. Um, but here I had spotted these these sort of spring vents on Google Earth that I, I wanted to go see. And it turns out like like uh, these these vast water bodies created by um, Russians that were drilling for oil in the 80s. They accidentally struck the, the uh, fossil aquifer there and the water spewed out into the environment, in some cases like geysers, creating these vast lakes that then evaporated and this salty mud crust formed on the surface of these lakes. But where the spring vents are still pumping out warm water from inside the earth, we get these little sort of blue hole openings. It was a bizarre, bizarre environment. And um, I was just sticking my head in the water, but it, it's, it, despite the fact that it's the Sahara Desert, it's January. So it's about, um, I don't know, 14 degrees maybe in the water there right then. And I was expecting much warmer water on that trip. <laughs> <laughs> so 
so this the, the that story you, you've told is you've heard about these geysers and this spring mm. water coming up is does that just set your brain in motion of there may be a cave system there that i could go discover and is that how you find these caves just through local yeah. local stories and local information mm -hmm. Yeah, a part of this was like that childhood wonder about, okay, there's oases in the desert, like water in the desert with palm trees that grow things. How is that happening in a place that doesn't rain? And I, and I just, you know, thought, where does the water come from? And that's where the research began and then linked up with stories of Alexander the Great that described some of these oases springs. And uh, next thing you know, I'm pitching to National Geographic to go there and look at them myself. Okay, let's uh, look at some more questions here. Um, sharks and wrecks, you definitely have the best, the best title and best, best name. name today. How do you balance the storytelling of the shots versus the aesthetics, or are they the same? Do you favor one over the other? Hmm, what a cool question. Um, it, you know, I always say to people that uh, they say, well, what kind of camera do you have? You must have a really good camera. That's a beautiful shot. <laughs> and I'm like, you know what? It doesn't matter what camera you have. It is about the storytelling. Like your shot, whether it's shot on a great camera or a GoPro, um, the good shots are the ones that tell a story immediately to the viewer. Um, so yeah, I think storytelling is pretty, pretty important to me. Plus I, I, I like to write and so it's a marriage of those those still images and the writing or or the video and the narration that that um, that I find important. I mean, I'm kind of that little girl in kindergarten that still loves show and tell. <laughs> uh, and Shark and Rex also asks, could you recover any photos from the cush crushed camera? Oh, no. See, that was a film camera. <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah, it, literally, like all it takes is for a button to implode to to fill a camera with water right and in that case it was it was film so yeah there was no recovering that if you flooded a camera today then your card's going to be okay even if it was in salt water just you know rinse it out in fresh water dry it off and you'll probably still have uh, access to all your images another benefit of digital when you do flood your camera <laughs> when <laughs> oh don't say that <laughs> i definitely don't want to flood my I got a new camera coming. I'm so excited. <laughs> yeah, well, let's let's talk. We'll, we'll get to that. Let's talk about some of uh, mm. some more of the gear because I've, I've pulled up some shots here that that really yeah. demonstrate the you know the hundreds of kilos sometimes that you're carrying just yeah. to, just to stay alive and do what you do, and then adding camera mm. equipment onto that. So I have a whole bunch of images here that, that showcase yeah. you. This was shot by Sandy Sandy Spurl in Newfoundland uh, when we were on a project exploring this uh, the Bell Island mine and uh, and part of my job obviously is all the documentation underwater. We were doing some shooting for Discovery and uh, documenting this mine and Sandy came along one day and just shot some incredible photos of of us in action getting ready for dives. Yeah, it's a lot of gear. Uh huh. I, I guess there's a lot of work. That happens way before any of the diving, right? All the preparation, knowing what you need, but then just lugging it all there and literally carrying mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah, in this case, it's it's a bit of a lug down into the mine, and and we have a lot of people helping us too. Yeah. Outsource all that if you can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, let's see if I can get this to move forward. Um, here's you just with your camera gear. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, that was all gear for, um, actually, we were doing the deepest man dives that had ever been done in Bermuda. So um, in this case, I was diving as deep as um, 460 feet deep. And I had to shoot video and stills on the same dive. So I had to have good lighting and a lot of strobes on the same dive and no assistance because my partner was a, a, a scientist who's who's grabbing biology and geology samples and we don't have a lot of time at that depth so i had to be able to do both yeah multitasking as always mm -hmm. this is a oh that's a selfie cool, <laughs> cool selfie deco selfie yeah yeah is that some is that a little heads up display that's just in front of you there yeah, it's letting you know um, basically the status of your life support. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Important piece of information. <laughs> mm -hmm. Really great one of the gear. Yeah. 
Yeah, this one was uh, shot by my dear friend uh, Becky Kagan. Shot. We were we we had a fun day together. We're both professional photographers, and and found ourselves in Florida. And it's like, ah, let's just go have fun and take pictures of each other today in the cave. And uh, so she nabbed that one of me. That's cool. Uh, yeah, this is under the ice in the Arctic. In this case, um, and you can see I've got like a rope attached to my. Uh, shoulder there and that's um, because there's pretty swift currents underneath the sea ice and so um, my Inuit guide partner is, is topside um, and he's actually got like an ice screw that's mm -hmm. jammed into the ice and then the ropes attached to that and he's kind of feeding it out um, so that if for some reason I'm overwhelmed by the current he can kind of help to, to pull me yeah. in yeah so let's talk about Antarctica you were Mm -hmm. crazy person that thought they'd be the first person to dive an iceberg and not just any iceberg like one of the or the largest floating thing on the planet on the which, planet yeah which was an iceberg or called b b15 15 yeah 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 crazy we pitched trip. to national yeah we, we pitched to national geographic to go down to antarctica intercept the iceberg and be the first people to cave dive inside an iceberg and document it and uh, and they gave us they gave us the go ahead, and uh, it was probably one of the most extraordinary expeditions of my life. <laughs> yeah, and, and it features in your book, and I'm not, I don't want to yeah. give any, any spoilers, but it's uh, it's a, a thrill ride all the way for anybody reading the book. I can only imagine what it must have been like uh, to be there, even just surviving the the the, the crossing to the iceberg. Uh, mm -hmm. It was incredible. I, we have some footage, actually. Maybe you can talk through this. Oh, yeah. This, this footage. Sure. Of, uh, oh, yeah. Nice this is a nice trip. day. <laughs> <laughs> That's a nice day. You have to leave from New Zealand and make a two-week two, a two -week crossing or 12 days to get to um, – this is the part of the B-15 iceberg. Um, so it's a long way down to barf your guts out before you get the chance to roll in the water and, and uh, experience these places. We didn't even know if we would find underwater caves in the icebergs. It was a hypothesis, mm -hmm. um, but one that paid off uh, incredibly well because these environments were more like going to the moon than anything else that I've ever done. I mean, I think the 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 remarkable and beautiful nature of the surface of the ice is, is worth dominating. Yeah, you've told me before how you've, it, the, the ice looked like a golf ball. Uh, mm -hmm. I think this this still here just sums that up incredibly, just this dimpled you know, surface. Yeah, that's still, it's interesting where you froze that because uh, my colleague Wes Skiles shot a picture of me. It's almost exactly that shot um, and landed on the cover of National Geographic around the world. Uh, so that was, that was kind of neat. But uh, yeah, I think we can see just how, how violent the crossing was. If you said that was a nice mm -hmm. day. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, an extremely dangerous crossing. You were, you were doing something mm -hmm. that, you know, no human had done before. Uh, diving mm -hmm. caves inside an iceberg and you had no communication and you were I want to say twelve and a half thousand miles away from your nearest port and <laughs> New Zealand. Yeah, yeah. I mean there's nobody to call for help. There's uh in fact the National Science Foundation uh from the US, we had applied for a permit with them and they said mm, no. <laughs> So our permit was from New Zealand and we actually got a letter from um, the NSF saying, listen, you're on your own down there. Like if you run into trouble, don't come crying to, you know, the U.S. to rescue you. If you choose to do this, it's it's on your own. Yeah, we have some some stills from that trip as well. Yeah. Yeah. So that's we had to use this little hoist to get us into the water because there wasn't sort of a level way um, off the boat or back onto the boat. And sometimes you have to get back onto the boat pretty quick because the whole pack ice can kind of move in and want to crush you between the ice and the boat. Um, and I'm carrying, uh, that's one of our canister lights. Uh, so it's pretty heavy, heavy light. Um, and then I would have grabbed the camera too before, before submerging. <laughs> you did have uh, your kind of Shackleton moment where you did get stuck in the ice pack. Uh, <laughs> We did. Well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we spent uh, yeah, a good 24 hours completely stuck in the ice and wondering whether we were going to get released or whether that was it. <laughs> yeah. Is this the is this the image that you were talking about earlier maybe? 
Well, actually, this image is shot at an iceberg in Newfoundland. So this right, is okay. with my my dive buddy. But but the ice looks really similar. Very like similar. you can see the way it's kind of carved by the hand of the sea. And those those furrows that you see, those little channels happen. Like icebergs roll, right? As they melt, they they suddenly shift and roll because their weight distribution changes. So th this probably would have been topside, and water was kind of melting and running down and creating these channels um and then it gets and unstable it and then it flips yeah yeah Incredible. this is mm. definitely b15 this is b15 yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah that's dropping into the cave yeah tell us a little bit about the, the, the gear on your back there because it's it's slightly mm -hmm. different looking from a lot of the gear i saw you with mm -hmm. earlier is that just the color yeah. thing, or were they pretty unique to that situation uh, it, it's an earlier rebreather. It's the Cislunar Mark V rebreather. And on the back, I've got mounted one of the battery packs on the right for uh, for one of the lights. And still carrying, like you can see, a sort of gray canister that's being carried on the right too. That's another light. And then on the left, there's a battery strapped on there that's actually fueling a little bit of a like a heating pad that's sitting on my on my kidneys. It's trying to stave off some of the chill it's really cold <laughs> trying unsuccessfully <laughs> yeah yeah um, i'm <laughs> delighted to to have some uh wonderful smug mug ambassadors in the chat today as well oh, uh great. rashid joins us from from the uk who's uh, another incredible uh diver and uh photographic educator uh Saeed, Fantastic. thank you for joining us uh it's just stunning images uh and then i saw a little chat uh, from Adrenal Media, uh, John Rourke, who's an incredible motorsport photographer, but uh, is quite the adventurous chap as well. Uh, and he mm -hmm. asks, what kind of power are, you, are your strobes? I uh, found that water seems to absorb huge amounts of light. Yeah, it's always a struggle, especially in underwater caves or in, um, you know, deep ocean environments. It's a really a struggle to, to get enough. So I, you know, can take you know, eight slave strobes with me or more recently though, I've been um, doing continuous lighting. I'm using light and motion solar pros. Um, so, you know, 15 to, 15 to 30,000 lumen range stuff. And I'm, I'm really excited that my, my newest camera that's on the way is a Sony Alpha One, which is gonna um, give us some good um, low light uh, well, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and uh, it's funny because uh, Valentina said, so what's the new camera and why? Uh, so you uh -huh. you've ordered the new Sony Alpha One. Alpha. Uh, ordered, paid for, <laughs> just waiting anxiously. Yeah, um, so I often am in the situation where I have to shoot both stills and video on one dive. And that has required me to carry two camera housings underwater. And I've got, you know, a good way to kind of balance those, like I clip one to my butt and balance it on the back of my legs while I'm shooting with the other one um, so that I get the best stills camera and the best video camera. But the Sony Alpha One is going to do both in the same housing. So that's kind of exciting for me. And the capabilities are off the charts. The, the autofocus and everything is 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 gonna be, I think, useful underwater where uh, sometimes autofocus is a real challenge underwater. Yeah. yeah. Look forward to hearing all about it when you when you get it. Um, mm -hmm. Got a few more yeah. images, um, I'm conscious of the time, but you are someone who likes yeah. to tinker and, uh, you know, work with your gear and uh, you, yeah. you, want, you told me uh, that the first yeah. thing you asked for when you bought your gear was a, a schematic of your regulator. <laughs> um, yeah. But yeah, you, you like to get yeah. into the, the guts of things, yeah? yeah. I'm actually making rebreathers here. So um, I was up at the Interspace Research um, facility making Megalodon rebreathers for a Hollywood movie called The Cave. And uh, we, I, I decided that that was the technology we were going to use for the movie. And I, I phoned the manufacturer and said, hey, you know, we need to buy uh, probably 12 to 15 of these rebreathers. And he's like, well, great, we'd be thrilled with that, but we don't have 12 to 15 on the shelf. And if you need them, you're going to have to come help build them. <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah, I ended up up there and it was the best way to really completely immerse myself in that, that technology and know, know the rig so that I could repair them all through the, uh, the eight month process of making, making that movie. Yeah, so you mentioned movies, you are a filmmaker, 
Um, you're a technical mm -hmm. expert for a lot of films and you know, you've directed and shot your own films, but you've also worked with some interesting people, um, such as James yeah. Cameron. Yeah. So, um, I, one opportunity I had to, to, to work with a wonderful, incredible fellow Canadian, James mm. Cameron. And this was, um, when he was uh, shooting the, the pitch trailer for the movie Sanctum and and testing the cameras for uh, Avatar. So uh, we had the opportunity to, I, I had the opportunity to take him on his first cave dives and then also be his uh, stunt diver for uh, the pitch trailer for Sanctum, which was really fun. Um, he is the hardest working person I have ever been with. I mean, he does not stop. Uh, the hardest working person we know is actually you. For, for <laughs> We yeah. went through uh, stuff we've done. Um, you also you also like to have uh, some downtime away from the projects yeah. and just shoot artistically, yeah. and you know we we'll get some some yeah. lovely shots here. Uh, and this oh no, sorry this yeah. one here this is a very interesting shot oh, a bit of fun. Yeah, yeah that was in Croatia. Um, I just c caught this moment of a friend of mine who was free diving, and that's his little daughter. You know my daddy the frog man. <laughs> I just thought it was so cute when Nika kind of patted him on the head. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, I gave a quick glimpse of it there. But you, as well as photography, you you're a real artist as well. You you mm. like to create a lot like of different paint. mediums. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Especially in these COVID times, I've been taking the opportunity to kind of you know <laughs> reawaken some of my my talents in in painting. And these are all you know based on my experiences and exploration. And this is Northern Ontario where I spend a lot of time canoeing. Yeah. Beautiful yeah. stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. Right, let's see uh, some more questions here. Uh, sharks and wrecks. Is a lot of dive gear mm. rather monochromatic? Do you prefer your models to be monochromatic or do you have a favorite mm -hmm. accent color? Yeah, tech divers are crazy. They love to look like cool and black and all black. And, and I'm like, color, please bring back the 70s and 80s. Um, yeah, it, like we lose color when we go underwater, right? Um, so we need to see red and orange and yellow. And, and when people wear colorful dive gear, I'm over the moon. It makes all the difference in the world. Uh, but you can't get a tech diver to wear color. They think it, it looks stupid. <laughs> It's a bit like skiing. I, I, I love my skiing, and you know, back when I learned in the eighties and nineties, it was all psychedelic, you know, yeah. bright, bright colors, and then it went all went black. Everybody wanted to look like James Bond or something on the on the ski slopes, and black. yeah, but color color is definitely coming back to to that world mm -hmm. as well. So mm -hmm. uh, that's pretty cool. Uh, John from Adrenal Media says, "I have the A one on order too. Tick 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 tick." Yeah, I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> um, mm. The couple of, couple of images to finish, and then we have one more little video. Then we'll we'll, we'll wrap mm -hmm. things up with a few more questions. Um, a lot of what you get involved with is you know um, developing new systems and working on new systems and uh, mm -hmm. inventing uh, new technologies. And you've worked with you know a lot of technology that uh, you know is future tech uh, when it comes mm -hmm. to to being underwater and you. You worked, I know a lot, to, to kind of 3D map uh, the underwater mm -hmm. systems, yeah, under cave mm -hmm. systems. Yeah, I mean, this is a, a fully autonomous, artificially intelligent robot cave mapper. And, uh, you know, I, f I was a part of the team that made the first ever accurate three-dimensional map of any underground place back in the late 90s and and this is the this is the child of that project that's been developing ever since and and this will eventually go to Jupiter's moon Europa to explore the liquid ocean beneath the frozen surface so yeah. it's pretty fun to be on the team to help you know test and 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 always document its history yeah yeah preparing for, mm -hmm. for yeah. all off planet so i wonder if there'll be signs like this yeah. on jupiter <laughs> i love that because we put these signs up as a safety program to keep uncertified cave divers out of a very dangerous environment yeah. so i had to laugh when the robot came up to the sign and started to like look at it because because the robot kind of moves right and it yeah. kind of goes oh should i go to the left of this or should i go to the right of this should i go over it should i go under it and i, I just laughed that it, it stopped at the sign as instructed and i managed to take its picture <laughs> so so as a community 
when you mm-hmm. when you know these places are dangerous, you, you you as the community go down and put these warning signs as well as all your guidelines that are there as well. But you t- you put these yeah. warning signs there. Uh, what, yeah, uh, mm-hmm. I mean, cool. people. The the number one fatality uh, sort of demographic used to be just regular open water divers, like instructors, actually, that went into the cave not really understanding the risk that they were taking. Nowadays, since we've got the signs and more safety and education programs, and we talk about not diving in these places in scuba classes, um, now the fatalities are are no longer those people who kind of lose their way in the in the system and don't belong there. It's it's actually more often the experienced ones mm-hmm. that um, are going beyond their their limits of their training or experience. Yeah. Yeah. What intrigued me here was this this autonomous vehicle had obviously been drinking. There's the two can of beer. There's two cans of beer in the stop sign. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Never dive and drink, folks. It... No, don't do it. <laughs> um, and this this looks yeah. like a Hollywood movie. Um, so you know, yeah, that's incredible. that's actually me driving that mapper back in 1997-98. This was shot by Wes Skiles, who's uh, no longer with us. Um, but so this is the baby, uh, or, or sorry, the grandparent of the uh, the robot the mapper, one. really. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, just, it's an incredible, incredible mm-hmm. image. It's such an incredible story uh, mm-hmm. image where there's just so much going on. But you know, one day maybe this will be humans on Jupiter. You know just uh yeah. doing, it, doing it as well um incredible mm-hmm. incredible images um i want to come back full circle mm-hmm. to this into the planet <laughs> this uh, is your book which i discovered after um after watching your ted talk i went and got the book and read it mm-hmm. um i want to encourage everybody that's watching today to go get this book uh from amazon or wherever you buy your books and and read it it is an incredible, scary thriller, edge of the seat, um, <laughs> you know, story of your life. I could not put it down. Yeah. It was absolutely incredible. And I was ter- terrified for most of it. <laughs> Good. <laughs> <laughs> but to think that it's your memoir and, you know, the realization mm-hmm. that, you know, having spoke to you that, you know, just the, the situations you've been in, the, mm-hmm. you know, the, the loss and the grief you've had to go through within your community, mm-hmm um the you know the the number of times that you know it's nearly been your own life it it's it's an mm-hmm. incredible read and I'm, I'm glad you're here to to mm. to write the memoir and let us know all about it thanks thanks yeah it kind of ended up being a bit of a memoir for the time i mean although it's my expedition tales and and uh, my life story it's really about fear and um uncertainty and i think so many of us are dealing with fear and uncertainty in our own ways right now. So I guess the timing was right. Yeah. And we have a, a little trailer uh, for the book, mm-hmm. uh, which which sums up a lot of what we spoke about today. It's some great imagery right. in it. Uh, so we'll play this trailer and then we'll answer yeah. a few final, final questions. Mm-hmm. If you only heard my voice, you would not guess my career. My workplace frightens most people. And if you got inside my head, you would meet the ghosts of dozens of my friends who have lost their lives in the blackness of underwater caves. What I do is really dangerous, but it's worth it. In my work, I've had a chance to touch the void reaching places inside the planet where nobody has ever been before. In a work day, I might swim below your home, through conduits in volcanoes, or cracks in the world's largest iceberg. You might find me roaming the Sahara Desert, documenting lost warships, or exploring mystical caves full of the remains of ancient civilizations. Working with scientists, I've helped discover new species, documented our Earth's changing climate, and filmed with technology destined for space. I've had to test the bounds of endurance and the strength of my soul. And to excel, I've had to learn how to master fear like no other. My new book takes a deep dive into adventure and science 
and an intimate and truthful look at the sacrifices made to chase an unconventional career. Into the Planet will transport you deep into the most exquisite, untouched corners of the Earth, where the innermost parts of the human condition are laid bare. This bit right at the end is where it gets super claustrophobic. This I've seen images of you crawling through spaces like this, and I do not know how you make your brain take you, or your body take you through these places. It's... And that's actually like a selfie setup. I've jammed the camera in the rocks and then set up my own lighting, and I'm like squeezing through that little passage for the shot. <laughs> Increasing, yeah. Do do yeah. yourself a favor, folks. Go check out Into mm -hmm. the Planet, um, an incredible read. Uh, there's a few que questions here. Um, yeah. Uh, John from Adreno, John, I'm going to let you read the book because there's a whole section <laughs> in the book about that. So uh, we're yeah. not going to answer that today. But he also asks, is there any crossover on space innovation with rebreathers? Well, I think we've also answered that mm -hmm. in, in mm -hmm. some of that technology that, uh, that yeah, uh, we Yeah, it's exactly the same. Earlier. Yep. Yeah, it's exactly the same thing you use for a spacewalk. <laughs> yeah, um, and now, you know, inventing technology and innovation that doesn't even need humans. They're going to go do it autonomously, mm -hmm. which is incredible. Uh, mm -hmm. Gary asks, where have you not dived that you still want to go? You know, I haven't been to the Galapagos yet, and uh, that's pretty high on my uh, bucket list. If you could say I have a bucket list, I'm not sure if I do, just because every day's so awesome <laughs> but yeah i'd love to get to the galapagos yeah it looks like an incredible place uh i mm -hmm. think we've covered most of the questions there thank you so much yeah. oh, oh, another great smug mug uh ambassador there conor mcneil says that is a great video yeah that last video really is, is wonderful it sums it up uh lloyd muckle says thanks jill and it was an honor to dive and learn from you at truck and aaron all right <laughs> good to hear from you all thank you so much yeah, everybody, for thanks. for all the great questions and and the conversation going on there in the chat mm -hmm. if you want to hear a little bit more of me and jill talking uh at a bit more a bit more deeper level than just the photography then uh, i'm delighted to say that jill uh is my guest or our podcast uh, known as the Photography Lounge. So if you search for the Photography Lounge, wherever you like to listen to your podcasts, you will find the latest episode there, episode 11 with Jill Heinerth talking about Into the Planet and talking about your life. So you can find out a little bit more and listen to me and Jill talk a little bit more over at the Photography Lounge. I've put all the, the links to all your various social and website and the book here in the description. Uh, of of the the live stream, so go in there and uh, have a have a good look at, at Jill's work and and just follow the incredible awesome. things that you have done. Jill, thank you so much for all your oh, time thanks. today. It's awesome speaking with you, Alistair. Always a good time. <laughs> yeah, you know, I will find any opportunity to talk with you because you literally leave me in awe with with what Aww. you do. Um, <laughs> you, you're really inspiring, motivating to us all. And, you know, we can't wait to see where your next ventures take you once we're able to travel mm -hmm. again. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, a little, uh, you know, might be the moon. Who knows? Um, <laughs> we'll see. We'll you'll see. have to listen to the podcast to find out more. Uh, but, yeah, thank you so much. Wherever you have been listening today, stay safe, look after each other, be kind. And we will see you back here for another episode of Smug Mug Live very soon. Jill, thank you so much. Take care. Stay safe. Thanks so much. All right. Take care. Bye, everybody. Thanks for watching.